White Whales Came by Michael Moore Purple Chapter 6 The elation that followed the discovery of the timber and popple stones did not last for very long. For as the months passed, the shadow of the war grew ever closer to the islands and began to darken all our lives. Talk of the front and fence soon became as common as talk of pilchards or crayfish, lobster or potatoes, and as important to all of us on the islands as the weather itself. At home, as the news came in, off more ships sunk, and more retreats on the battlefield in France, father became ever more despondent and angry. All the joy and exuberance he breathed into our lives vanished during that first year of the war. He rarely smiled, even at me, and he never sent me up on his shoulder as he used to do on the way back home when we, when we had been out fishing together. Indeed, he took me out with him less and less now. He said it was too dangerous with the German submarines lurking out in the Atlantic. And it was true they had been sighted quite close to the islands, but that was not the reason, and I knew it. He just wanted to be on his own. At home in the evenings, he would scarcely ever speak to us, and he, and when he did, he often spoke harshly to mutter. I had never before heard him speak unkindly to her. He would sit in silence by the fire, rolling his pipe in his teeth, staring vacantly into the flames. And the house became a place of gloom around him. Mother tried her best to lift father's spirits and to placate his rages, but could do neither. No more could I. It was from Mr. Walt Locke at school that I learned about what was happening at the battlefronts of France. Frequently now, the blackboard at school became the battlefield of the Western Front. I welcomed these extended lectures on the progress of the war, because at least it meant we might be missing an arithmetic lesson. Like some omnipotent Greek god, he pushed and wheeled the great armies to and fro across the blackboard, forecasting with great conviction our inevitable, our inevitable and total victory. He told us that even if we were not winning yet, we soon would be, because God was on our side. Mr. Wellbeloved talked with great pride and fervor of the bravery of our little army, holding its own against the German hordes sweeping through France. We could help our soldiers, he said, by making blankets and socks for them. And so we did. I remember he wrote out message of exhortation and stuffed them down the socks we had made before packing them away in boxes to be sent off to the front. But socks, he said, were not enough. We had to be vigilant and report all once anything, anything at all that looked suspicious. Invasion, he said, was always possible. We had to be prepared. Whether it was Mr. Walpole's word, words that inspired the war games, I am not sure, but I do know that it was Big Tim who organized them up on Washoe. With rifles and bayonets, rivaled from the Riftwood, the two armies, one British and one German, would be drawn up opposite each other on either side of the hill. Big Tim would blow a blast on the battered bugle his uncle had brought back from the World War. And that was the signal that would send the two armies screaming towards each other. Over the heather, the battle that followed was always swift. The outcome always the same. After all, it was Big Tim that picked the sides, and he made quite sure the British always won. Either the Germans would run away or they would fall dying noisily on the spongy grass around the rabbit warren at the bottom of the hill, and Big Tim, dressed in his uncle's pith helmet and waving the Union Jack, could always be seen standing triumphant of the battlefield at the end of the day. Of course, they tried to make us join in, but we had no wish to be cannon fodder in Big Tim's war games. And besides, we were always far too busy building our boats and selling them. That was what we told everyone, and they had no reason to doubt us. In fact, of course, we slipped away as often as we dared to Birdman's cottage on Heavy Hill. For Daniel and me, his cottage became a second home during the first year of the war. And I was happy enough while looking with Prince along the center of Russia Bay, for needing the Birmingham snow for him and the wet weather 
when his fingers were too stiff and painful. The bird man never asked for help. He was just the kind of person you wanted to help. I suppose that was why I offered to milk his goats for him. It looks simple enough. And I had milked a cow before, after all. A goat was smaller than a cow, so it had to be an easier job. I thought. I was wrong, very wrong. Goats know. They know everything. You can see it in their eyes. They know everything. They knew I was clumsy, and in that, they made it as difficult as possible for me. One of them, Bertha, it was, always walked away whilst I was milking her, and Betsy would turn around and chew my hair, pulling it at it until I had to stop milking her because it hurt me so much. Only then would she let go. I was determined to master the burn man's goats. But they knew that too, and so I never did. All summer, I tried. I tried gentle persuasion. I tried bribery, but milking always became a trial of will and strength, which I invariably lost. Sometimes Daniel would come with Prince and me down to Rushy Bay, and we would sail our boats together, as we had always done. But more often than not now, he would stay inside the cottage with the burn man and work on his carving all day long. I would leave them sitting side by side at the long table, chiseling away at an unpromising block of driftwood, only to return some hours later and then find the beginning of a gannet or a plover or an oyster catcher hatching out of the wood. To me, it was always a miraculous metamorphosis. They worked together with great concentration, even urgency for Daniel was ever eager to practice and to learn, and the bird man seemed equally anxious to teach him. I remember him saying once, I want to pass on all my father taught me, whilst my fingers still obey me, and they won't for much longer. The more Daniel improved, the more he seemed to enjoy it, and the more time he would spend carving with the burn man. As I worked, the burn man would talk and talk. He was making up, he said, for all the years he had only had the birds, the animals, and himself to talk to. I myself was never comfortable talking to the bird man in those early days. He would stare uncannily at me whilst I was speaking, trying to read the words as they came out of my mouth, so I would resort almost immediately to pencil and paper, partly to avoid those piercing eyes of his. Daniel never did that. Right from the very start, he mouthed the words, contorting his lips into extravagant shapes. He made letters out of his fingers and spelled out the words. He drew shapes in the air. Indeed, sometimes he did all three at once and talked loud at the same time. If at first the bird man could not understand, and he often did not, then Daniel would persist resolutely until he did. Sometimes this might entail acting out a complex charade, and both of them would end up helpless with laughter at his antics and the misunderstanding they created. It took some time and it was gradual, but Daniel invented that for a whole new private language, a signs, pictures, and signals that the birdman could recognize and understand immediately. So much so that I sometimes found the birdman could understand what Daniel was saying. Now before I could, I remember that one time I began to feel a little excluded even hurt by this, but the Burman seemed to sense my unease and took great delight in teaching me the new sign language he was learning. We became so used to using the new language that in time Daniel and I could talk to each other without uttering a word, and we would use it at home now instead of whispering whenever anyone else might be about and we wanted to talk about the Burman or Rashida. In time though, the Burman loud learned how to read our lips well enough to understand most of what we said. We had to sp speak slowly, of course, and make sure he was looking at us before we began. We still use our secret language, but he needed it less and less as the months passed. We found out early on that there were some things you just did not talk about to the birdman, any mention of the war, for instance, any talk of the latest outrage or offensive Mr. Wellbeloved might have told us about, and he would simply turn his back and walk away, 
It seemed to plunge him into a deep despair, and so we learned to never talk of it. Neither we discovered would he ever talk about himself. If we asked him about his mother or his father, he would just turn his head away and pretend he could not hear us. And when, then one day, Daniel asked him about Samson. It's not really true there's a ghost on Samson, is it, Mr. Woodcock? The bird man stared at him. You know, Daniel said. He put a blanket over his head and drifted around the room, arms outstretched, his muffled moanings and groanings inter interspeared, per interpersed with giggles. Like this, Mr. Woodcock, ghosts, Gracie believes in them, but they're not true, are they? Not really. It was the only time I'd ever seen the bright man angry. Terrified at the same for me, I backed away until I felt the wall behind me and could go no further. further. He advanced on Daniel, pulled off the blanket, took him roughly by the shoulders and shook him. Ghost, he cried. A ghost? Do you know what a ghost is? Well, I'll tell you. A ghost is a soul so dark and with shame and sin they can never rest. It is a spirit condemned to wander the earth until the end of time. Yes, there are ghosts on Samson. You cannot see them. You cannot hear them. But I know they are there. They are all there. All the guilty men of Samson. My father with them. His voice was full of anguish as he went on. His spirit is still there on Samson. There are and they always will be, unless the curse of Samson can be lifted, unless I can save them. Until then, that place is cursed, so keep away from it. Stay away, both of you. After that, I never dared mention Samson again, and nor Daniel. For fear of discovery, we could not spend as much time as we would have liked with the Birdman. We knew it strength our alibi. If we were seen from time to time to be sailing our boats on the pool under Guel Hill, and now the swans have finally left, we could do that again. In Daniel's boat shed that first spring of the war, I busied myself repairing and repainting our fleet of boats whilst Daniel worked tirelessly on yet another puffin carbon. This was the seventh. He had rejected all the others. It would be finished, he said, only when it was perfect. Quite, quite perfect. Each of them seemed to, to me, to be more puffin like than the one before, and I would have been proud to have made any of them. But he was never satisfied. He made endless puffin sketches and pinned them to the table in the shed, just as the birdman had taught him he should. It was while we were working side by side in the boat shed, one drizzling May morning that we heard a distant dull boom. We took very little notice of it at the time. We thought that perhaps one of the navy ships might be firing a practice salvo out to sea. We had heard them often enough before, and we had seen several grey warships cruising in and out of the islands off late, their threads bristling with guns. Not until father brought back the news the next day <sighs> was I to find out what it was. He, he had been off to St. Mary's that morning to sell our catch of lobsters and crayfish, as he always did on Wednesdays, providing the seed, providing the seed was calm enough. Mother and I were down on the rocks fishing for rest when we saw him bringing the boat in over the sandbars towards the cave. We watched him throw out the anchor and leap down into the shallows. We could see as he came along the beach towards us that the change had come over him. He walked briskly over the sand, jumping from stone to stone and hurdling the rope. And an another chains as he came, an anchor chains as he came. I could feel Mother's arm come around me and I knew she was bracing herself for something, but I had no idea what it was. Clemmy, he called as soon as he was within earshot. Clemmy, I've done it, and I feel ten years younger for it. Should have done it long ago. He was smiling, now as he used to, and I wondered why it was that. 
Mother was looking away from him, as if she did not want to hear what he was about to talk. You remember that explosion we heard yesterday morning? Well, they sank another freighter. Plenty, Father went on. Not five miles from here it was. Submarine again, just waiting out they were. And they picked her off and sent her to the bottom. All good men, all gone. They told me all about it over on St. Mary's. As soon as I arrived this morning, I saw for myself a couple of lads out there on the beach. Washed up on the tide this morning. They were. They were young lads. Both of them barely out of school. Half my age. Clemmy. Well, that was it. That was enough. I decided there and then. I wasn't going to stand by anymore and just watch it. It isn't right, Clemmy. You know it isn't. They need sailors and I'm a good one. Better than most, we Salonians are the best navigators in the world. We have to be, don't we? So anyway, I went and signed the papers, Clemmy. There's a dozen or more joining up from all over the islands, but I'll be the first from Briar. It's all done. I joined the navy at taking the king's shilling. Mother's arm tightened around my shoulder, and I looked up at her. She was smiling at him. I'm not going to argue with you, she said. You wouldn't listen to me anyway, would you? I knew you'd be going sooner or later. I knew it had to come. You won't go short, Clemmy, said Father. I've worked it all out. I'll be sending money home all the time. Pay's not bad, you know. One and a penny a day? You and Gracie won't even need to work the flowers and potatoes if you don't want to. There will be enough for both of you. Don't worry. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about the money, said Mother. Gracie, Gracie and me can manage till you get back. Can't we, Gracie? We'll, s- we'll see to the, lo- to the flowers and potatoes. Might even catch a few lobsters. You never know. It's not just men that can catch lobsters, you know. No, it's you I'm worried about. Me? said father. Stuff and nonsense. And he picked me up and set me high on his shoulders. You're getting heavier by the day, Gracie, he said, as I put my arms around his neck. You used to hang on to my beard when you were smaller, remember? It's a wonder I've got any left. And we walked back up to the house, happy together for the first time in months. Don't you worry about anything, climbing, he said. I'll be back before you know it. Won't take long this war, not now. I'm in it. Now, dear, said Mother. Not now you're in it. And she put her arm around him and laid her head on his shoulder. When will you be going to the water, Father? I asked him from high above them. Soon, he said. And it was soon, all too soon. Only a week later, Mother and I were standing on the Side at St. Mary's, and Father was hugging me to him. He looked so fine and grand in his blue uniform. Maybe it was my pride in him that stopped me crying like everyone else seemed to be. I took his beard when I kissed him. Goodbye. And he laughed and then whispered, Take care of your mother for me, Gracie. I remember thinking that was all that was all the wrong way around. For Mother had always been the one to take care of me. And then he laid a hand on Mother's arm, brushed her cheek gently, and said, Bye, Clemmy. Shin up. And he was gone up the gangplank and into the ship. We waited until the ship was so far out that we could no longer distinguish him from the others waving beside him on the deck. At least he's his old self again, said Mother taking my hand and leading me away. At least he's happy now. They won't sink his ship, will they? I asked Mother. On the way back home, across the water to Brian. Of course not, Gracie. Don't even speak of it. He'll be back, you'll see. I told the Burman the next day that my father had gone to be a sailor in the war, and he smiled sadly and put his hand on my head. Daniel and me will look after you, he said. We'll look after you and your mother. Oh, we do. I'll be your father till he gets back home again. 
How would that be? That would be fine, I said. Just so he gets back, though.